Enjoy the session. Hello, welcome, welcome to the genome session. This morning uh, we have uh, three proceeding talks. And the first one is going to be by Benjamin, and he's going to talk about uh, Benjamin Plantero, sorry, and he's going to talk about revisiting genetic artifacts on DNA methylation microarray exposes novel biological implications. So whenever you want. Hi everyone, thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. So today I'm going to talk about something that lies in between genetic inter-individual inter variation and human epigenetic studies. And this is a field that is not often talked about, and today we're going to talk about artifacts. Okay, so let's break the title down into its pieces. So we have uh, human DNA methylation. This is one of the most studied epigenetic markers. And you might be familiar with chromatin and histone modifications, but today we will only talk about chemical modifications on DNA itself. In the context of human DNA methylation, this is CPG methylation. So a CPG is if you walk on the five prime to three prime direction in your favorite genome, every now and then you'll find the CG dinucleotide. Well, the Cs in either strand can be either a methylated where there's no group in position five or methylated where you have this methyl group there. And this is a key signal for genomic regulation. Why do we care about this? Well, what we do is the so-called epigenome-wide association studies, which is the GWAS equivalent in the methylation world. And what you do there is you measure CPG methylation for a given CPG in, for example, cases and controls, and you ask, is there significant differences? If so, you found the GWAS hit, an e was hit, sorry. And the key insight here is to look at the numbers. So these are thousands of individuals. The only way of doing this without breaking the bank is by using chip technology. And the only technology that allows this is so-called DNA methylation microarrays, which is the other part in the, in the title. Okay, so the microarray, DNA methylation microarrays, look something like this. This is a silicon chip. It has several slots for each sample. If you zoom in one of these slots, you see that the silicon surface has little holes Inside the hose, you have beads, and the beads themselves, they are covered in oligonucleotide probes that are 50 nucleotide long. And these uh, macroarrays are provided by Illumina. They have the monopoly. And to give you an idea, they are like 10 times cheaper than the sequencing equivalent. Okay, how do they work? So first thing, we is extract DNA, and here's the trick. We use bisulfite conversion. This is a chemical treatment that translates methylation differences into sequence variation. So C is cytosines that are methylated, they become T, while those that are methylated, they remain C. And this way you translate uh, methylation differences into sequence variation. In this case, we have a CPG site. A priori, we do not know if it's methylated or methylated. And as a result, we write this as this Y, which is the UPAC notation for either C or T. Then there's the simplification step, fragmentation, and we hybridize against the microarray. And here what we do is the probes that were in the beads, they, uh, they act as a primer, and there's a single base extension after the primer. And you might add, uh, in this case, an addition of A or T is colored as red fluorescence, addition of COG is green fluorescence. You scan the microarray for the two channels, and you quantify DNA methylation. So the quantification is a bit more delicate than what you would assume a priority. And the reason is because it really depends on how it was designed. And there's three simultaneous designs in the array occurring simultaneously. I won't go into details, but just bear in mind that it really depends what type of probes we're using. Okay. So I've told you that bisulfite conversion is this magical ingredient that converts uh, DNA methylation differences into sequence variation. But this is a really bad idea, right? Because we have inherent genetic variation. So 
inevitably, when you design the probe design, what you, do, what you do is just assume that the template you will assay is the reference genome. This is, of course, false. And eventually, you end up with so-called genetic artifacts, which is the failure of bias in DNA methylation quantification caused by underlying genetic variants on the DNA template that were not accounted for during the design of the probes of the DNA methylation microarray. This is complicated because it really depends if it's SNP, those structure variant, what was the design of the probe, the relative location and the alleles of the genetic variant, also some probes bind to the Watson or the Crick strand. So all of this needs to be taken into account to make a prediction whether a genetic variant will cause an artifact or not. Okay. So this brings us to software. In this case, uh, this is the MIFI R package, which is basically uh, the standard in the field. And uh, before this, people used Illumina Genome Studio, which is proprietary software, I know. And uh, this is a very extensive R package, and they have a section dedicated to how to remove genetic artifacts. And they claim MIFI offers the possibility to remove probes affected by SNPs. And the way it does this is two-liner. So you have this genomic set object, you add SNP information, and then you drop loci with SNPs. And you do these two magic lines, and suddenly you've solved the problem. As a bioinformatician, we often have to face this kind of problems. What do we do? Do we assume that their implementation is good, or do we critically assess what they implemented? In this case, this was during COVID, so I have plenty of time, and I decided to look into this black box. What I found, I did not like. In this case, the first thing you do is help, ask for help, and this is the help page that MIFI devised. Is they put together all of these different functions on the same help page, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, if I haven't counted wrongly. And if you go to the details section, the only information on this function is blah, blah, blah. No idea how, what this function is actually doing. So again, black box. So the only way to understand what this is doing is going to the source code and reading line by line. I did that. And basically what it's doing is uh, using an annotation that was previously built and this annotation was built in the, certain, in the following way. So you have the position of the SNPs in your favorite reference genome, and you have the position of the probes, and whenever there's some localization between the SNPs and the probes, you label the probe as a bad probe. If there are no SNPs, it's a good probe. But this has lots of problems. Let me name a few. I said SNPs, but there are many other genetic variants. In this case, what about Indus? There are lots of Indus that are pretty frequent, and they can cause genetic artifacts. What are we doing about them? The, the thing is that these SNPs that they included here, they filtered with a 1% allelic frequency. As a result, rare variants are not included in this list, in this annotation. So in this case, we are using very big sample sizes. Eventually, we expect to find rare variants. Are we ignoring this problem in the case of rare variants? The other problem is that the allelic frequencies they filtered, they are global populations, but we all know about biogeographic ancestry and how it changes allelic frequencies between different populations. So shouldn't we use a different annotation for each ancestry? And finally, the annotation file was built on this annotation from 2012. I think it's about time to update it. And what, uh, annoys me the most is that there's no mechanistic insight. So this is a complex assay, and no one sat down and tried to figure out what different genetic variants will cause into the assay. Okay, so, and also it hasn't been empirically validated, so we have no idea what's the false positive rate and false negative rate of this approach. This is relevant for many reasons because this same platform is being used in the context of genetics of DNA methylation. So what they do here, for example, is find so-called methylation quantitative trait loci. 
This is just when you measure the methylation of a CPG, and at the same time, you genotype many individuals, and you ask, is there differences between the genotypes and the methylation level? If so, you found an MQTL. But the problem with genetic artifacts is that uh, that artifact is caused by a genetic variant, and that genetic variant is in LD in linkage disequilibrium with all the neighboring uh, genetic variants. And as a result, if you have genetic artifacts there, you will find lots of MQTLs in your data, which are just false positives. Also, heritability is a problem. So people are using uh, this same technology to measure the heritability of DNA methylation. But, uh, and they do this by using monozygotic and dizygotic twins. Of course, if you have genetic artifacts, you are overestimating the heritability. Finally, it's also the platform used in the Cancer Genome Atlas. In cancer, you expect genomic rearrangements, and they can be a big problem when you're using a micro, microarray-based approach. Here, for example, I also show you another study where they claim that they found rare epigenetic variation by using very huge sample sizes. They use this platform. So maybe what they discovered is extremely rare genetic artifacts. This brings us to the paper. And this we published in Genome Biology. And the idea is to develop benchmark data-driven tools towards the quantification and qualification of genetic artifacts. And uh, to do so, we built a working understanding how the genetic artifacts actually interfere with the methylation assay. And our overarching message is to challenge the current standards on how people are dealing with genetic artifacts in DNA methylation microarrays. To give you a taste, I don't want to go in much details because I know most of you are not uh, so familiar with this field. So first thing we did is move away from the methylation ratio, which is what everyone is using in this field. And instead, we are working with the fluorescent intensities. The reason we do this is because many times a genetic artifact causes probe failure. Upon probe failure, you grab, you take a background fluorescence in both channels, and it looks something like that. But when you transform this in the methylation scale, given that background fluorescence is more or less the same in both channels, it looks like intermediate methylation. So by moving away from the methylation scale, we have a huge gain in resolution. The other thing we did is we used cohorts with monozygotic twins. And this way, we can, for example, many genetic artifacts cause clustering in the, in the UN plane, unmethylation, unmethylated, methylated intensities. And what we can do is ask, do monozygotic twins always fall in the same cluster? And this we can use as evidence that there's a genetic basis to this artifact. And also, we can estimate allelic frequencies and compare them with databases like in DBSNP. We made an R package, and it's available in GitHub. OK. Given the uh, significance of our results and how most people ignored this problem, we organized some dissemination, some seminars. Uh, we contacted some of the big cohorts that are using this technology. And what we did is we went to their papers, went to their figures, selected uh, genetic artifacts that they, ha they had highlighted in papers, some of them nature communications. And what we did is prove them that they were artifacts. They did not enjoy that too much, but it was a very good way to convey the message that they had to do something about this problem. OK, this brings me to the conclusions. So in, when we code, we have to compromise between how much we encapsulate and standardize and how much we leave to the user to critique and how much we can repurpose. So the problem with this package was that it was too wrapped so that no one could see what was happening inside. And uh, yeah, bad documentation builds wrong expectations. Don't get me wrong, MIMFI is still a really powerful library, and you should not stop using it. It's actually still very popular by the bioconductor statistics, downloaded thousands of times a month. But yeah, the biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. I would like to acknowledge, of course, uh, my supervisory team. And if you enjoyed what you heard, please go to the paper and read all the details. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.
Good, so we have time for questions. Yes? So you said that you were able to show that the published results were artifacts. And then, so using your method, were you able to come then with new biological conclusions in those studies? And maybe in second question, you said that the, uh, the, the, the guys from those studies were not happy. What were about the MINFI guys? Were they happy with your criticism? I haven't spoken to MINFI, the MINFI people, but uh, yeah, I don't know. But uh, to the first question, it's a bit more complicated because uh, these studies, uh, for example, the MQTO mapping, they find lots and lots of findings. But when they want to show a shiny figure in the front, they go to the biggest significant results and those happen to be the genetic artifacts. So the reason they ended up in their figure is because they have the biggest effect sizes and yeah, if they had taken care of the genetic artifact problem, maybe they wouldn't have ended up in the figure. But it's true that it doesn't really compromise all the conclusions of the paper because genetic artifacts are a minority within the realm of all of their findings. That's something to bear in mind. Okay, more questions? Well, so I have one. So, yeah, you're making a lot of friends with this, <laughs> noticing these, these things, but uh, that, that means in the literature then there is these artifacts are still there, no? Are, is there a way that, that this will be corrected or something or? It's complicated, yeah. I've, every different study uses slightly different lists of, for removing artifacts and the result is that depending on the study, you might find more or less artifacts. And we try to quantify uh, how many genetic artifacts there are in the literature, but it's a really hard problem because it's really study dependent. So going back to the literature and try to revise what's genetic artifacts and what's not, I don't think it's going to be possible. Yeah. Okay, so we thank Benjamin again. Thank you. And our next speaker is Sophia Alsenstein, and she's going to talk about deep seed, deep seed F, improved DNA binding prediction of uh, seam finger proteins by deep transfer learning. Uh, this is not my uh, slide. <laughs> So hi all, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the slides. And uh, today I will talk about uh, DIBS DEF, improved DNA binding prediction of C2H2 zinc finger proteins by deep transfer learning. So what are C2H2 zinc finger proteins? C2H2 zinc finger proteins are the largest class of human transcription factors as they account for almost 50% of all human transcription factors. And, they, and these proteins are characterized by a DNA binding domain with multiple zinc fingers. And here we have an illustration of a zinc finger. So we can see that it has a very unique structure. It has an alpha helix and an anti-parallel beta sheet. Uh, the zinc ion in the middle is essential for stabilizing the fold and is coordinated between two cysteine and two histidine residues. The loop that's being marked now is a uh, remind us of the finger structure. And from here comes the name C2H2 zinc finger. So typically these fingers are arranged in tandem comprising the DNA binding domain and the subset of these zinc fingers multiple, uh, bind, bind multiple uh, DNA triplets. And through this binding, these zinc fingers uh, play a, a role in a wide range of biological processes such as uh, gene development, gene recombination, chromatin regulation, and of course, gene expression. It is very important that, that the identification between the zinc finger and the DNA will occur accurately, as it might influence many diseases, such as cancer, COVID, Alzheimer, and more. 
And today, despite the essential role zinc fingers play in cell function and gene regulation, little is known about which of the zinc fingers bind DNA and how their DNA binding preferences are encoded in the amino acid sequence. So now we know how to uh, uh, recognize the special structure of the zinc finger. But actually, we are interested in recognizing it in an amino acid sequence. And lucky for us, we can do it very easily using the regular expression. So here we have the regular expression of the binding domain of the zinc finger. And we can see the two cysteine and the two histogen residues. The 12 residues in the middle are the actual zinc finger. So if we look at an example, here we have part of a sequence of a protein, and I marked the zinc fingers, the 12 uh, residues, using the regular expression. Also here, only part of the zinc fingers bind DNA. Okay, so the next question we can ask ourselves, which of the 12 residues actually bind DNA? So it's common to number the positions of the zinc finger from minus six to plus six while skipping zero. And actually, only four out of the 12 residues bind DNA. And uh, where three residues bind the current DNA triplet and one residue binds the next DNA uh, triplet. And the following question for us is, okay, but which of the residues influence the DNA binding preferences? And for many years, it was considered that only these four residues uh, influence the DNA binding preferences. And this approach is usually called the canonical model. However, recent studies have shown that more uh, positions might influence the DNA binding preferences, and today we have the extended model with seven residues, and the full model with the, which can take into account the all 12 positions. And this is the place to note that most of the existing uh, methods for predicting DNA binding preferences are based on the canonical model, ignoring the, uh, the potential contribution of other zinc finger positions. Okay, so in this research, we propose the DIBZDF pipeline, which for a given C2H2 zinc finger uh, protein sequence, first identifies the zinc fingers, it's easy using the regular expression, then classifies the binding and the non-binding zinc fingers, and finally, only for the binding zinc fingers, it predicts the DNA binding preferences, the DNA triplets. And again, this is the place to note that all existing methods predict uh, DNA binding preferences to all identified zinc fingers which is biologically wrong. Okay, let's uh, talk about the data sets we use in this research. So the first one is the B1H data set, which is an in vitro data set and has uh, 1,209,000 uh, uh, binding zinc fingers. Here for each zinc finger, we have seven out of the 12 residues. And the second data set we used is the CRC data set, which contains 157 uh, human C2H2 zinc finger proteins. Here for each protein, we have the binding zinc fingers and their appearance index. And for each binding zinc finger, we have the 12 amino acids, the whole sequence. In total, there are 834 binding zinc fingers. And for both the B1H and the CRC data set, the DNA binding preferences are shown or represented by a PWM matrix. Okay, and using the CRC data set, we constructed the binding zinc finger classification data set. So what we did for each protein in the CRC data set, we downloaded its complete amino acid sequence from the UniPro database and identified the zinc fingers in it using the regular expressions. The expression. And the zinc fingers that also appeared in the CRC data set were labeled as binding zinc fingers, and all other identified zinc fingers were labeled as non-binding zinc fingers. So in total, there are 834 binding zinc fingers and 789 non-binding zinc fingers. Okay, so for the rest of my talk, I will present the BindZF predictor and the PWM predictor. Finally, I will uh, present the whole pipeline, DIBZF. And let's start with the BindZF predictor, which classifies binding and non-binding zinc fingers. Okay, so here we have the BindZF predictor architecture. As you might have noticed, we have a limited amount of data, 834 binding and 789 non-binding zinc fingers. So we wanted to benefit from the transfer learning technique. And this technique, you take a, a pre-trained model that was trained on a massive data set and continue training it on the new data set. This procedure is called a fine tuning. 
And what we do is we, uh, we, we utilize the information that has been already learned while assuming that this information is relevant to the new problem. So in the Binds Def Predictor, we fine-tuned the protein bird transformer by adding to it a fully connected layer and a signal, single neuron with the sigmoid activation function. The input to the Binds Def Predictor is the ZF sequence with concatenated neighboring amino acids from left and right. And the, in the DIPZF pipeline, we used the Binds uh, Def Predictor that was trained with 40 neighboring positions from left and right as it uh, achieved the highest result. Okay, let's move on to the PWM predictor. And here we have the PWM predictor architecture. And we can see that it's a multi-layered perceptron network with a starsified last layer. As a pre-processing step, we one-hot encoding the input sequence resulting in a 20 by L matrix, 20 representing the amino acid alphabet, and L, the number of the zinc finger position we used. So L can be four, seven, or 12, and here in the example, it's 12. We fed forward the input through the network, resulting in a 12 long vector. And here we applied a softmax function on each quartet to receive a PWM. Again, we have a data problem. The data is limited. So we wanted, again, to use the transfer learning technique. And we first trained the model on the B1H data set, and then retrained the entire model on the CRC data set. This way, we utilized the most stable in vitro, in vitro data, the B1H data. And in the DIPZF pipeline, we used the PWM predictor that was trained on seven B1H positions and then retrained on the 12 positions of the CRC data. Okay, let's move on to the DIPZF. So for a given C2H2 zinc finger protein sequence, we first perform zinc finger identification using the regular expression. Then using the BINZF predictor, we get the classification of the zinc fingers. Finally, by thresholding, we get the binding zinc fingers. And using the PWM predictor for each zinc finger, we predict a PWM, which we then, concate sorry, that we then concatenate. And for evaluation, we use MOSBAT, which uh, calculates the similarity between two pair motifs, the predicted and the uh, ground truth PWM. Okay, let's see some results. So we evaluated zip uh, by comparing it to multiple baselines in terms of zinc finger DNA binding prediction. So we have the binding zinc fingers as it was predicted by the bind ZDF predictor. We have the all zinc finger case where we assume that all zinc fingers are binding. We have the only binding zinc finger case where we took the binding zinc fingers as it appeared in the ground truth. And finally, we also uh, have the random case where we choose randomly binding and non-binding zinc fingers with probability 0.51. And we can see that DIPZF achieved mean Pearson correlation of 0.41. And for the all zinc finger case, the achieved mean Pearson correlation is 0.36. This might seem like a close result. However, the p-value indicates that this is a significant result, which means that the DIPZF learned meaningful information. We can see that it's critical to, uh, it's, uh, criti to, uh, to have proper classification of the binding zinc fingers. As for the only binding zinc finger case, the achieved mean person cor correlation is 0 0.87. And finally, for the random case, the achieved mean person correlation is 0. 0 0.08, which proves the efficiency of the DIPZF model. Also, we can see that DIPZF outperformed all existing methods, ELSVM, ZF models, and RFB1H, which are machine learning-based methods for predicting DNA binding preferences for a given C2H2 zinc finger protein sequence. Okay, let's talk about interpretability, and let's start with the BINZF predictor. So here we wanted to see the attention, the model, the attention value the model assigns to each uh, position in the input sequence. So just a reminder, the input sequence is the ZF sequence with concatenated neighboring amino acids from left and right. And in each panel, we show the, bind, the binding domain of the zinc finger by the regular expression. And we did it, this experiment for three different contexts. Context for the uh, for the for the first when uh, the zinc finger is the first zinc finger in the in the protein sequence when the zinc finger is the uh, inner zinc finger in the protein sequence and when the zinc finger is the last zinc finger in the protein sequence. Of course, the first and the last zinc fingers have only one neighbor. 
And what we can see, it's actually very interesting, we can see that the network assigns high attention values to specific residues. And actually, these are the residues that between the cysteine residues. And if we look closely, we can see that these high values appear periodically. And actually, for uh, the network looks at the cysteine residue, at the residues between the cysteine residues in the neighboring domain. So just to sum up, to decide if a finger is binding or not, the network looks at the residues between the cysteine residues in the current and the neighboring domains. Okay, let's see PWM, PWM predictor interpretability. So we, want, uh, we use the uh, sharp explainer to see the amount of contribution of each amino acid at each zinc finger position on the recognition code of, the neclo uh, of each neclotid at each DNA position. And as, as, uh, as, as it was expected, the, the results are, con uh, are consistent with the canonical model. So the first uh, DNA, pos uh, DNA position is mostly influenced by zinc finger position plus six. The second DNA position is mostly influenced by zinc finger position plus three. And the last DNA position is, almost, is mostly influenced by zinc finger position minus one. And we can see here a, a new association between the last zinc finger position and uh, between the last DNA position and zinc finger position plus two. Okay, so let's sum up. Here we presented the DeepZF pipeline, a deep learning-based model for predicting binding and non-binding zinc fingers and their DNA binding preferences, giving the only amino acid sequence. If, to the best of our knowledge, BindZF predictor is the first uh, method for classifying uh, zinc fingers. Also, PWM predictor is the first deep learning approach for uh, predicting DNA binding preferences. And we saw the DIPZF inferred a biologically relevant uh, information, which is new. Uh, we can see the link to the paper. And I would like to, help, uh, to thank Dr. Yaron Orenstein for all the help during the research and all the lab members and all the scholarships we got on the way. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so we have time for questions. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, it was really engaging. Um, I think around slide, the, the slide you were talking about, the Pearson correlation, um, you mentioned that the correlations were close, but you backed it up with a p-value of 0.08 and you used a significance level of 0.05. Um, is, this, is this correct? Um, did I interpret it correctly? Yeah, so when, when, I hope I understand you. So uh, for the dips of death, the mini person correlation is 0 0.41. And when I used all the zinc fingers, I said, okay, let's uh, assume that all zinc fingers are binding. Let's see uh, what we get. And the mini person correlation is 0 0.36. And at the beginning, I thought, okay, it's very close. But then I uh, calculated the p-value between the results and I saw, it's a I saw that it's a significant result. Uh, and that was 0.08? Uh, it was a uh, little bit uh, less than uh, 0 0.05. Zero, oh, okay. Oh, okay. sorry. I misheard you. Thank you. <laughs> More questions? One at the back. Thank you. Um, wanted to ask about, maybe I didn't hear exactly, um, how did you get the first set of zinc fingers at the beginning. The binding and, and the non-binding zinc fingers? Uh, yeah, I mean the, 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 the set that you started with. Ah, yes. And, so. and with that, I, I wanted to ask whether you, if you were tried to enlarge the sets saying using hidden Markov model programs or I don't know, what, whatever else, mm -hmm. did it significantly change the, the outcome afterwards or not? Okay, so I will start with the first question. So how I got the, the binding zinc finger classification data set. So I had the CRC data set where I had only the binding zinc fingers and the protein names. So I went to the Unipro database and downloaded its complete amino acid sequence. And then I identified the zinc fingers using the regular expression. All the, all the zinc fingers that also appear in the CRC data set I considered as binding, and all the remaining uh, zinc fingers I considered as non-binding. 
And I didn't have time to do the hidden Markov models or to enlarge the data set, but it's a good idea. Thank you. More questions? Yes. Does it work? Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Um, really nice uh, talk. I would like to ask you, you have checked uh, on different sequences of the patterns of the zinc fingers. I can't hear you. Can you uh, talk to the mic, please? You, you yes. were oh, thank you. <laughs> you were checking all the different sequences from the proteins that contain zinc fingers, mm -hmm. and then you match the patterns. Did you also check if the secondary structure was preserved? Because these zinc fingers have to contain an alpha helix, then the loop, and then the beta uh, strands. This is a good idea, but we haven't time to check it. it. To get the classification result, it took us a lot of time. So actually, we, at the beginning, we, we got a network that uh, did the PWM predictor, and we, it took us a lot of time to get, uh, to get uh, some good results or su sufficient results for the classification part. So we, haven't, we didn't have time to continue with it. But there are really many good ideas how to proceed this research. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We thank Sophia again. Thank you so much. And the next speaker is Alexander Mitrofanov, and he's going to talk about uh, an approach for CRISPR track RNA detection. Uh, thanks a lot. It's really great to be here. And uh, today, I will be talking about a robust approach to search for CRISPR trace RNAs. Um, but before jumping on the topic of searching for uh, trace RNAs, I have to tell you uh, about the uh, CRISPR defense mechanism. And prokaryotes, they have a truly amazing defense system. And the way they battle viruses is truly astonishing. So once survival, so I mean, a viral attack, a prokaryote can take a piece of viral DNA and integrate it into its own DNA and then use this information as a sort of database, the storage of potential intruders. This uh, storage, which is called CRISPR array, is then used as a form of uh, CRISPR RNA. And CRISPR RNA is used as a, as a guidance uh, which uh, guides a uh, protein uh, cassette to a binding site and then cleaves a, a virus very efficiently. So, um, um, since the discovery of uh, CRISPR arrays, we, uh, the, the studies show that we have many, many, many different types of CRISPR systems. We have class two and cl class, class one and class two CRISPR systems, and they are different in a way that class one needs a protein complex, a set of proteins to efficiently cleave the viral DNA, while uh, class two systems, they only need one single protein to efficiently uh, do the job. And as you might know, class nine, the discovery of class nine, uh, changed the era of uh, gene editing drastically. But despite that only one protein is needed, uh, those systems, they usually need a slightly different guiding complex. In, in addition to CRISPR RNA, they also rely on tracer RNA, which first binds CRISPR RNA and build a more complex uh, guiding tour. So uh, part of the tracer RNA builds the, uh, binds to the repeat part of the CRISPR RNA and then forms this uh, big, uh, single-guide RNA. So now when we know what tracer RNA looks like, like and um, how, how can we uh, approach an efficient way to search them and uh, potentially avoid uh, false positive results. So since um, we know that tracer RNA binds to the CRISPR RNA, it's very natural to first search for the CRISPR RNA itself and maybe the absence of CRISPR-A in the uh, uh, genome will give you an idea that the search of uh, trace RNA is going to be in vain, like there is no such system. And the 
CRISPR allocation might give you already in some intel where like the region of potential tracer RNA. <laughs> and lastly, and the most importantly, CRISPR repeat uh, part is so heavily co complementary to the tracer RNA and repeat part that it's a nice good seed for potential search. So in order to go for and search for uh, CRISPR A's, we've, we've picked CRISPR identify. And this tool, uh, well, similar to the other tools in the market which are targeting identification of CRISPR arrays, uh, it gives you the interval of the all potential CRISPR arrays. But on top of this, it tries to fit all potential representation of every single CRISPR array and finds the best representation but by, doing, uh, by uh, utilizing machine learning. And a set of the features in this tool, we use uh, features like repeat uh, length, repeat identity, how homogeneously spacers are uh, present in the CRISPR array, and how many mismatch or mutations are in the array. This gives us uh, not only the best representation of the CRISPR array, but also a pseudo um, score, like um, pseudo um, confidence of how much of the probability, so the probability of how much we should trust the identified CRISPR array. Like, should, should we consider this to be a, a true example or maybe a false, false positive? And if we start uh, with a false positive CRISPR array, we might f end up with false positive uh, trace RNAs in our search. Since of this high complementarity between CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA, CRISPR repeat, like, like repeat from the CRISPR array, is a nice seed. And we initially can concursely search for uh, our candidates by using the, the repeat sequence and blasting it as a, as a query versus the genome. It will give us some, some hits. Of course, some hits will have lower, uh, very low uh, length and very low similarity. And some hits will be naturally in the CRISPR array area because we will hit the repeats of the CRISPR array. Those can be then, of course, filtered out. But we are interested uh, in the interaction, and therefore, this initial pre uh, prediction of anti-repeat part can be further Im improved with Entarna. And Entarna is a tool which uh, targets RNA, RNA interaction, and it's exactly what we need to, 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 to see how uh, strongly those two bind, because they don't bind perfectly, they're usually like bulge and uh, bulges and so on. But uh, hybridization er energy can give you already a clue how well those two potentially can bind. We can also target the identification of the tail of the tra tracer RNA. Usually for, let's say, type 2 system, which is on the screen, those tend to form uh, two to three hairpin loops. And uh, for our data set, we can see a moderate conservation in terms of sequence and high conservation in terms of um, structure. And therefore, uh, tools like GraphClast, which uh, naturally build you, builds you a, a set of uh, potential clusters, uh, can be used. And then we can, uh, it also provides you with a, a covariance model, which can be used uh, uh, for uh, hidden Markov model search uh, with, for, for a new candidate, like an, a tool like Infernal can, can, can do the job. But I will talk about um, uh, our data set in the results section. So we combined our previous steps with two more. First of all, we also added search for the terminator sequence. And terminator sequence basically identifies the part where the uh, tr um, translation will be stopped. Um, and uh, on, top of it, on top of this, identification of the uh, terminator sequence also adds uh, some information if the tail of the sequence which we predict is correct. And of course, since we are doing, uh, since tracer RNA is supposed to guide like a protein complex, it's, it's really necessary to identify the cross corresponding protein because if the protein is missing, maybe your candidates are all uh, false positive candidates. So with, with this, we have a we have a tool which uh, not only provides you with like information about potential regions of tracer RNA, but also also uh, keeps the 
uh, probability scores. So first we, we go for the array itself, and then of course you have uh, hybridization of the and repeat sequence, then you have the uh, hit for the tail sequence and how similar it is to a given database, and then presence of the uh, terminator sequence. On top of this, we introduced three cons consistency scores, like uh, we can predict the orientation of the CRISPR array and see if the predicted trace RNA uh, has the uh, compl complementary uh, sequence. And uh, for the end repeat part and the, and the uh, tail part, we can see if our predictions overlap and uh, if the overlap is big, if probably one of the predictions is uh, a false prediction or if there is a huge gap and like we, we predict that uh, end repeat part is placed very far away from the predicted tail part. Of course, we can do the same with the tail part and the tracer and the terminator sequence. Uh, for each of those uh, scores, we allow the user to, to pick the weight and treat the final score as a linear sum. Of course, uh, the final result will depend heavily on the, on the type of research and some biology, like biologists might know that they have a, a working CRISPR array despite the fact that maybe the score, the confidence score for this array is low. They want to then uh, pick the weight for, for this information very low since they, they are sure that this is a working array and so on. It, it up, it's up to for a user to associate the weights of those uh, scores accordingly. So I would like to talk about the results which we uh, have in our work. So um, it's very important to like, since everything else uh, was built, like the, the, the part which is uh, building the model for the tail part it was missing. And for type two systems, we took uh, available data from public publication of um, Brenner, Brenner and colleagues. And in their publication, they already uh, uh, classify uh, the sequences into three different clusters. We took the available data and carefully removed the end repeat part since it can uh, corrupt the prediction of the structure and then submitted the uh, sequences into the graph class pipeline and were surprised that we came up with the identical structure as in the publication. We were able to replicate uh, the results with only graph class approach. We then iteratively added some new uh, sequences from further publications one by one and uh, enforced the, the fact that those structure are not broken. Like let's say if, if the sequence, the new common sequence is breaking the structure or introduces one more novel cluster, we just discard <laughs> such, such sequence. Um, we also built like phylogenetic tree and can see, as you can see here, uh, they, uh, the, the clusters we obtained are heavily consistent with the clusters you would approach, uh, you would obtain from the uh, phylogenetic trees. Um, for, uh, this was for type two models and for type five models, uh, we were uh, having, let's say hardships since we had to create the data set ourselves. So for that reason, um, Marcos, who is a co-author of this paper, uh, search for uh, Cas12K protein in the available data set and then um, search for trans corresponding transposones, compared it with the existing tracer RNA and then aligned uh, all the uh, sequences to the first um, to uh, re repeat to avoid, to avoid false positives and then of course predicted the secondary structures of, of those. So with, with this, he provided me with the set of 91 um, tracer array candidates and only two of those are uh, wet lab uh, verified. So in order to, to be sure that our test, uh, like our data set is not corrupted, we again used graph class two, but in this, in this scenario, we decided to go for a cross validation approach when we uh, kept like one fifth of the uh, data set as a test set and the rest as a train set. And we could see that uh, with any fold, like with any uh, distribution, we could see that the, every single test set candidate got uh, five to, to, to six hits from uh, the trained model. Even if the 
uh, wet lab uh, sequences were in only in a test set. So with this, we, we thought it's, it's a quite consistent data set. Um, we also compared our results uh, with the results of Dudley and colleagues. They also tried to um, like a cluster, um, make a clusterization of the huge uh, comprehensive data set of uh, trace RNA sequences. They also investigated the CRISPR rays and uh, uh, the presence of the CRISPR ray and the uh, terminator sequence, and then took the uh, candidates and then clustered them. We, uh, after, after we calibrated our model to provide like fairness com comparison, we could see that our model is uh, much more specific, meaning that we have like much higher uh, power of E values. Uh, but not only this, but um, their model is heavily dependent on the presence of um, end repeat sequence, meaning that it's slightly uh, biased towards uh, sequence, not structure, because the end repeat part of the, of the trace RNA doesn't bind to the trace RNA itself, it binds to the CRISPR RNA, and therefore, if you input this and try to predict the structure having end repeat uh, as is, it will corrupt the predicted structure. And we could see that their model is, uh, relies on this and therefore probably uh, more of a sequence type model. So we can see a lot of future improvements to our approach. And of course, this approach will heavily benefit from uh, a novel data. And you, you, as, you can, as you know, um, there are more and more types being discovered. And therefore, we will have more and more data for uh, even existing types. And of course, um, this, this approach only covers type 2 and type 5 systems. And there are many more. And um, we have to find a way to to cover those as well. And um, of course, we would like to maybe go and investigate um, some, some more complex tracer RNA structures. And to, 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 to say complex, I want to present you with, with this. So in, in contrast to type uh, two systems, type, um, type five systems, tracer RNAs are much more complex and interact with the uh, CRISPR RNAs in a different way and forming a lot of uh, structure like pseudo loop, like uh, pseudo loops, uh, pseudo knots, uh, stacking like and hairpin loops. Whenever I see this picture, well, when I, when I saw this picture for the first time, I was astonished. And uh, well, for me, it was this kind of reaction. Like I, I, I didn't know, I'm, I'm by information, I didn't know where to look at. And, but uh, Marcos briefly told me that, yeah, we can, we can go for like different and repeat areas uh, and then like investigate eight different types of stem loops and pseudonaut motifs and promoter motifs and so on. So uh, our approach is available on GitHub and yeah, implemented fully in Python. Uh, with Conda, you will get all the C dependencies, so uh, it's no problem to replicate the, the data we have. And uh, with this, I want to thank you. And yeah, of course, thank all the people who, are, who were involved in the project and also Chase Basil and Milad Miladi for their intels about uh, a better way to approach such search. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have time for questions. Hi, thanks for this uh, great talk with respect to the tracer and guide RNAs. Um, I've been wondering because you made a little bit of comparison of these different tracer detection methods and my current uh, thought is what are the implications for the adjacent guide RNAs that encoded? Have you maybe an idea? Is there um, maybe some method that finds not only the trace RNAs in the predictions but also finds the biologically more uh, uh, significant guide RNA predictions? For instance, is, is, are they more specific to a certain virus or have off yeah. targets in some weird ways or this is this is a great this is a great uh, question actually this whole idea of searching for trace rnas is more or less a step towards uh, generating potentially a very useful single guide rna because like the combination of crisp rna and, and trace rna forms something which is basically a single guide rna right like if, if you're artificially make the, this tiny loop and, and create them, it will, it will allow you 
to create like a very powerful single guide RNA. And ba basically, this is exactly the the goal, like to, to investigate it deeper and how efficient they are, and maybe yeah, make it uh, make a better single guide RNA uh, someday in the future. Thank you. More questions? No. Okay. If not, we thank all the speakers of the session.